My name is Kelly Yarbrough, and I'm the Director of Community Programming at Prairie Wood Retreat and Preserve in Manhattan, Kansas. Normally, I'd be busy coordinating our public event series, like yoga, open trail days, and artist receptions. But it's a weird time. In-person public programming is out. But I can't help noticing that some things haven't changed. The earth is still spinning and spring is upon us. We still need sunshine and fresh air. We need connection to each other and to places that matter. The Places Between Us is part podcast, part walking tour. Conversations from a distance with artists, poets, educators, and changemakers as they take us on virtual walks through their own special places. Hey, Aubrey. Hey, how are you? Awesome. Well, do you quickly just want to introduce maybe um, yourself (laughs) and where you're calling in from today um, and then just a brief description of of where we're walking today in the video. Yeah. I'm Aubrey Strike Krug. Um, I was born and raised in Kansas and not that far from where the walk that we're taking is. Uh, right now, I direct the Ecosphere Studies program at the Land Institute. Um, and our central campus uh, is in Salina, Kansas, so right along the Smoky Hill River. And we're lucky to have this little prairie remnant of Wahab Prairie um, with a little path down through it. And then it goes down to the east bank of the Smoky Hill River where we have research plots. So um, right now I'm walking us through Wahab Prairie, which is named for people who used to um, own it before the Land Institute um, came acquainted with it. and. Along the walk, I make a lot of stops to look at plants. It's a short walk and it takes me a while because I like checking out the plants, um, though it's changed so much in the season. So where I grew up is about uh, 80 miles northwest of of where we are watching right now. Um, It's in the Blue Hills. um, So limestone, rocky, prairie hillsides. And that's where you're going to see the antelope porn milkweeds, the little blue stem. Um, So those plants uh, have a very special place in my heart. We just saw lead plant is in bloom right now. (laughs) I I visited your website earlier today and noticed that you had a nice photo of uh, antelope porn milkweed. (laughs) And I think I remember you saying that that's one of your favorite prairie plants. I also really, really adore um, prairie turnip, which we just saw here too, um, next to that pink steak. There's a reason that those prairie turnips are, have steaks next to them on this prairie. I like to know exactly where they are and be able to see them. So you, you mentioned Ecosphere Studies at the Land Institute. Um, for those who might not be familiar with, um, with that program or with the, the Land Institute, would you mind giving a brief introduction to those two? entities? Sure. So the Lynn Institute was uh, founded back in 1976 looking for uh, more sustainable alternatives to uh, ways of living um, and fitting within the lively dynamic sphere of life, the ecosphere on this planet. Um, And over the 40 years since, the Lynn Institute has um, intensified and focused efforts on Uh, solving the problem of agriculture by creating new perennial grain crops um, and learning how to grow them for a maximum positive ecological benefit and connecting those with people who care for and care about those crops and consume them um, and relate to them. So uh, the Land Institute right now has programs in plant breeding and in ecology and this ecosphere studies program that I direct that explains explores the social and cultural um, and economic dimensions um, and educational dimensions about how people create new relationships with these uh, plants through domestication processes, about how people learn to change their um, perspective and to relate in positive ways to the larger planet, um, as well as the places that we're embedded within. You describe some of your work as being situated within the environmental humanities. Can you describe a little bit what that term means and what that encompasses? Yeah, so my training is in um, is in English and Great Plains studies. And so it might be surprising um, that someone with a PhD in English who studied Native American languages and literatures um, would end up at an agricultural research center. But actually the 
um, stories that we tell, the norms and the values that we have, the ways that we speak and communicate with each other are very much related to the possibilities we see um, for creating new types of relationships um, and new agricultural systems. So just think about the culture part of agriculture and connect that with the with the humanities and the social sciences as well as the natural sciences. So eco-criticism, this area is um, the study of the relationship between literature and the environment or literature and ecology. Um, and the environmental humanities um, includes eco-criticism in other areas too. But maybe to give a little bit more concrete example of how I apply this would be to um, think about some of these civic science communities that um, these perennial civic science communities that I've been piloting that we were speaking a little bit about before and I can explain more now. So with some of these uh, new uh, crops that we are domesticating, we are uh, sharing seedlings and plants with wider, more diverse communities of people to grow them um, in their backyards or homes or farms or gardens around the country and to uh, care for them, um, to collect data on them, especially with what types of pests and pathogens uh, might emerge in these different locations, um, but also to start um, understanding how they might culturally value them. And people who come from different cultural backgrounds are going to be bring different questions, um, observational habits, um, different habits of community interaction. So through this civic science project and through these communities, people send us you know, physical observations, but they also are telling us stories. They're taking photos, they're being creatively inspired. Um, and those sort of that cultural knowledge production, those stories, um, those images, those things like that are also a form of, of data and a form of knowledge. And so the humanities offer tools and concepts and ways of asking questions that help us understand what those new uh, cultural modes of knowing, um, how they're being produced and what new stories are emerging and what stories um, a perennial agriculture might look like and tell and, and become as we move forward. Yeah. Um, this is kind of a loaded question and I, it's okay if you don't have a ready answer to this, but it's a, it's a timely question. So I want to, I want to ask it, but in terms of that work, um, and in terms of the conversations that we're having across our nation right now, and specifically we'll say in, in central Kansas where we are, how do we acknowledge and, um, Prioritize voices of color. You know, what a white occupation in the in this area. I mean, that's that's not where the story started. I don't know. Where does that fit into uh, what you're thinking about these days? Thank you for asking that. It's a it's actually a question that we've been thinking about for a while and, and taking actions and imagining new strategies to act on. So another big part of my training I mentioned has been in um, indigenous language revitalization and an ethnobotany. So the different cultural human plant relationships. And one of the plants um, the Land Institute is working on domesticating, we'll see at the bottom of the hillside here, I'm sure I stop and look, um, is Silphium integrifolium or rosin weed. Um, and so this is a native North American prairie plant um, that many indigenous communities have had long-standing relationships with. Not, we don't think necessarily as a food crop or there's not documented ever, evidence in the West about that um, exactly, but there is um, documented medicinal use um, and other forms of relationship. So understanding that more um, and being able to revitalize that um, and connect with that as part of the domestication process is of great interest. We have a couple of, there's one tribal college and one reservation that are part of our pilot um, Silphium civic science communities, um, but figuring out how to bring more people into that is really important. And as we imagine the larger scaled up um, pilot communities, we've been um, exploring strategies to develop more community relationships that will help us figure out how to overcome barriers to access to participate because we need um, all these different cultural perspectives to make uh, much more resilient and robust um, relationships. So, you know, the project like this um, in our pilot community, most people um, demographic 
demographically trend toward looking like me. They're they tend to be more white, tend to be more women, tend to be well educated, um, and those are people who have the privilege of being able to participate. They have a backyard. They see themselves as gardeners. Maybe something like participating in science um, in a sort of academic or Western sense or a research sense that feels comfortable or interesting to them, and that is not necessarily true for many other communities. And so we need to think about how we might be able to provide stipends, for instance, to incentivize participation so that people could actually buy supplies or that they might need in a community garden. We need to provide models and examples um, uh, and other connection points. Um, we need to think about how to design a recruitment process that is much more broad reaching beyond, you know, the existing uh, people that we have. So there's a lot of questions there. Um, but I will say that, you know, this civics, the idea of an ongoing civic science community, this was sparked by a, one of our collaborators who I think, you know, Carmen Moreno um, in Kansas City, uh, who is an independent artist who uh, has piloted her own kind of civic engagement uh, workshop platform specifically for people of color. So. Um, many other cultures have, you know, models, traditions, and really important insights and community, commu long-standing community-based um, platforms that we need to be able to partner with and listen to and learn from. It's really important to our vision of the of a future that we're working toward. I mean, ecological and social justice are so interconnected, and when we imagine the type of world that we want. Uh, to inhabit, I think about how, you know, I'm not only thinking about, you know, something for my son, but for all children to have access. Um, and so that long term vision is very much part of how the Land Institute thinks um, and creating perennial agricultures that can feed and sustain just human communities is very much, um, I think, our approach. So I know from talking with you in the past that you collaborated on a project through the University of Nebraska, I, I believe. Um, putting together a, a textbook for the Omaha language, right? Yeah. I'm curious yes. to know if you can talk a little bit about that project. I also am just curious uh, if there are any particular interesting things that you picked up in, in, in regards to um, language and land. You talked about ethnobotany and sort of like, I, I mean, I, I'm fascinated by language too, so I'm just wondering if you um, learn anything interesting about how you relate to land or, or names for things even through that project. Yeah, oh, so much. Uh, <laughs> so I started studying uh, the Omaha language, Omaha Iete, um, when I was a graduate student um, at the University of Nebraska. It was a, a course, a series of courses. Um, I studied it for a year and a half through coursework. Um, and I, I started that because I was studying Great Plains um, and my advisor said, if you really want to understand the Great Plains, you should consider learning a Great Plains language. Um, so I found myself um, in an Omaha language classroom and um, it's fascinating. It's such a beautiful language. Um, and that turned into, uh, after the year and a half of courses was over, um, the opportunity to help contribute to this longstanding textbook project that was a partnership between um, people working at the university and then people working um, at uh, the Omaha Nation Public School System and the uh, uh, Omaha Language and Culture Center there. So it resulted in this uh, big collaborative textbook um, that is full of activities and different lessons um, that range from early to uh, college uh, sort of age curriculum and a glossary. And um, so just the process of being involved in that community uh, effort was really educational for me. I learned so much. I also learned uh, to re-see the landscape in which I had been born and raised. Um, there's a whole separate interview we could do specifically about sort of the grammar and language itself. Um, there's so much, but uh, in particular, just relearning different place names. Um, you know, I grew up uh, very close to Wakanda Lake, um, where Wakanda Springs was, um, uh, which is now underneath the lake. And uh, it was really fascinating to be able to understand more of what Wakan means, or to just even learn the names of these rivers, um, the Smoky Hill River of Pai Shudeke, or my home watershed, Niwahubeke, the holy water. Um, just, it really uh, opened my eyes um, 
in ways that I knew intellectually, but I think emotionally, um, the felt experience of relationship just became very different. With plant names um, and the ways in which, you know, the land is related to, I think that's shared across many um, indigenous languages and there's a lot of differences too. So yeah, I've written some about this and it's it's been really important for how I think about, you know, the plants that we've been looking at through this section of the walk, we're down in the research plot. So we passed by some uh, Kernza, I think we'll look at some Kernza and alfalfa biculture up here. We're looking at Silphium and an intercrop that we're walking by. So as we create these new relationships with future perennial crops, I think there's a lot Lot to be learned from the diversity of uh, really enduring and dynamic cultural relationships. How do we, how did indigenous communities, how have they created new relationships with plants? Um, there's so much to be paid attention to um, and listened to. Well, I know that um, you have done a lot of traveling um, around the world for your work and for, for different reasons, but you, um, you're from Kansas, you're, you're still working in Kansas. What is it about this place that keeps you interested and connected to it? That's a great question. Um, you know, growing up in a very tiny town in Kansas, um, a small farming community, um, I definitely got the message that, you know, you should leave and go somewhere else and, and that's how you you make your way in the world and uh, definitely having different cultural experiences and um, traveling to different places. I lived in Slovakia for a year and taught there. That has been really important for my learning and education but I've also come to see how even in one place, um, to be in this particular mixed grass prairie ecosystem, there's more here than I could ever learn in a lifetime. Um, there's so much, uh, so much beauty, so much troubling history, so much possibility still held within the landscape, so much that the land can teach. Um, and so to realize, sort of like you might spend a lifetime with another person and you're, you're still don't fully know them, they're still, a mystery to you in so many ways. I think that's how I feel about the land that I love um, and th these prairie ecosystems. I've, there's so much more that to learn and to experience. Um, and once I w was able to start seeing that and, and relating to that, um, yeah, I, I'm hooked, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I, or in love, maybe that's a better way to say it. I know you're busy working on some upcoming programming for the Ecosphere Studies program. Um, would you mind discussing just kind of generally some of the topics that you're hoping to cover? Sure. So Ecosphere Studies has had a past public workshop series and we've had different educational events um, and we're really interested in opening up these different questions and about you know what types of knowledge people need to gain as well as uh, what types of things we need to learn how to let go of or, or unlearn as we make a, a transition to a perennial future and uh, so the urgency around that certainly seems uh, greater than ever um, these days and I, so those are some of the topics that we often address in conversations. Um, we're looking in the coming year to develop more open access learning resources. Um, so I, this spring made a perennial practice video series um, to try to introduce some of these concepts and ideas and we're excited to continue to explore other uh, different media and ways that we might be able to connect with people as well as hopefully be able to host events again in the future at some point. Fun question. What are you reading right now? Are you reading anything that you're really into? <laughs> Always, um, <laughs> like 10 things. Um, <laughs> uh, so two, a couple books that I'm reading right now. Um, I just started uh, Kwame Dawes' uh, collection of poetry, Nebraska. Um, he's the editor of Prairie Schooner. I think a collection that came out relatively recently, but I hadn't got my hands on yet. So that's what I've been reading. And then a book that I've been reading with our research residents here at the Land Institute is called Data Feminism. And I highly recommend it's fascinating and well written and um, has been really uh, important for me to think through this sort of connections between the sciences and humanities um, and how I think about building a kind of digital infrastructure for engagement through civic science. Um, so yeah, those are two of my recommendations. Plus I've been reading Runaway Ralph with my little kid. Um, so. <laughs>
<laughs> well, this is a really lovely uh, footage of the prairie in, in a beautiful time. Yeah, I would encourage people who are interested. The Land Institute um, is not going to be having a Prairie Festival this fall, um, just for safety and public health reasons. However, we are going to be having a special digital announcement um, related to perennial agriculture. So I hope that people can join in and know that we are offering uh, socially distanced tours. And so people can still schedule a tour you can come visit the Lynn Institute and learn more about um, these research plots and also see the prairie. And um, I know, so we share that in common with Prairie Wood. And I just have to say again, thank you, Kelly, so much for the time and the conversation. It's always so good to see you, even over a screen. Well, thank you, Aubrey. I appreciate your time.